No, hey, a hot morning in July. Um, we're having a, a blessed episode today. I've got a, a guy from uh, right here in Texas and works for a, a ministry that's doing some amazing things. And I want to read a little bit about his bio. And we're going to talk about today uh, time to lead. And those of you that know me know that lead isn't just on the surface a word. It is going to be broken apart. L-E-A-D. We're going to talk about learning, executing, adapting, and developing. And I've got the perfect guest to unpack that. So I want to introduce to you Mike Jorgensen. Mike is the executive director of I Am Second, which is a ministry within a ministry of E3 partners um, that they equip churches and train pastors and really just reach out and uh, disciple uh, people that are in the ministry um, and planting churches. It's it's a great it's a great resource. Um, so, you know, he uses storytelling with I Am Second. So they're using this storytelling platform, you know, celebrities, athletes, various people of influence, and uh, to just give their testimony and talk about God's goodness. And uh, it's a powerful, powerful ministry. Um, he's led 70 plus uh, short-term international mission teams. He's uh, worked with over 400 mother churches to then, like I said, plant 400 new churches and seen over 38,000 professions of faith. That number has probably grown uh, since that, since I pulled that research, um, but decisions for Christ. And that's really what this is all about. And that's really how you, you know, really can gauge impact in my opinion, in the ministry for sure. Um, he's, you know, during that time, he's taught over 70 leadership conferences in 15 different countries. So this guy's passport is up to date, let's just say. Uh, Mike and his wife are, have been married for over 45 years, have three children, eight grandchildren, um, live near Central Texas, College Station, Texas area. So without any further ado, I want to humbly welcome Mike Jorgensen to the show. Well, thank you so much, John. It's a joy to be here and share with your, uh, your tribe. Yes, yes. And our audience, man, is this is going to be right in their sweet spot, I believe. And, you know, we're all, you know, a servant leadership platform. So we're all trying to become these leaders God created. And, and we've got a lot of groups that are out there that just kind of throw the white towel in and say, I'm not really designed to be a leader. I'm not real. Not everybody's a leader. Well, I, I've always disputed that. I think everybody has leadership qualities, whether we use those or not remains to be seen. So time to lead this outline came to me and, and this could be a series down the road. This might just be a standalone episode for you. Uh, so we're going to deliver some gold to the audience today. Before I do that, I want to have you maybe talk a little bit more about, um, you know, I am second and, and your role there, how that came about those white chair stories that, go, that, that it's really have been so impactful. Can you, can you shed some more light on that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Well, our uh, parent organization called E3 Partners, and we are uh, international church planting trainers. So we train um, believers, leaders, pastors in about 50 countries how to start new simple churches. Well, about uh, oh, 13, 14 years ago, um, Norm Miller, the chairman of the board of uh, Interstate Batteries, uh, in his quiet time, God told him, I want you to go all out in your Jerusalem and, uh, and gave him a verse, uh, John 12, 32, if I be lifted up, I'll give, I'll draw all men to myself. And uh, our organization had a great relationship with Norm. He came and he was in a meeting and he just mentioned this to a couple of our, uh, of our team and uh, two of the guys on staff at the time, uh, uh, Nathan and Adam were their names. Uh, they just kind of noodled it after after the meeting and just kind of came up with this idea of, well, let's just literally lift up Jesus. Let's get some billboards in Dallas. Let's let's see if we can get some famous people to tell their Jesus story on video, and we'll put it on the internet, and it'll be this this short term Dallas kind of evangelistic thrust. So. They took the idea back to Norm, and uh, much to our surprise, he said, that's great. Uh, would you, E3, do this? And we're like, 
you know, our first response thought was, well, we're international church planting. And at the time we weren't doing, all of our ministry was overseas, but we decided, no, let's, let's go for it. Um, because it's a short term thing and it's here in our hometown and everything. Well, obviously it just took off uh, the, uh, the power of the stories uh, just connected with people, the hope, the, the, the peace that they got from it. They could, they could see themselves in those stories. They were attracted by the celebrities initially um, and we had non-celebrities on there too, but they were just sharing uh, what, how Jesus had redeemed a, a situation. So that's how it got started. Um, and then over later years, uh, we've added discipleship materials to it. We've added, um, we've taken our, actually our international uh, strategy for uh, evangelism, discipleship, and starting new spiritual communities. And we've just embedded it into uh, the I Am Second uh, discipleship materials and which we have called live second so i am second is come to christ um live second is uh love yeah. and obey him yeah i mean that that's a that's an awesome story i i know that i've watched several of those stories and you just you get you just get captivated you just get locked in because you know of course we voluntarily or involuntarily uh put these people up sort of on this pedestal because of their stardom because of the influence they have and their celebrity. But man, the way you're using that in a good way, like that's, that's a platform for them. And so when you're locked in to that story, it's just powerful to hear some of these folks and you think, man, I never knew that. So I encourage folks for sure to go to that. I am second website. Um, so let's dive into uh, this lead outline, you know, the LEAD. Let's talk about learning and 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 along the lines in the same vein of, of the I am second theme, let's let's talk about what it means to you. Um, you know, when people learn of other people's stories, if we're talking about learning, let's talk about it in the context of they watch a story and they hear that powerful testimony from somebody they really had no idea and they've always admired them. Talk about learning someone else's story and the impact it has in people's lives, getting them closer to Christ? Well, I think, uh, you know, we have such a selfie culture that we always want to put the, our best foot forward. And, uh, and whatever we have online is, is not only the best of us, but maybe beyond what we really are. It, it's creating kind of an artificial mm -hmm. um, persona in yeah. many cases. And when what we've tried to do with the I Am Second films is show that no matter how famous someone is, no matter how on the outside they look like there's, there's fame and, and success and all of those things, everybody has issues. We're all broken. Yeah. And when, when people see that, they, they, they sense the authenticity in that and they're like, oh, wow, I see myself in that person. And I'm willing to um, uh, speak to somebody else, tell my story to somebody else and, and get help, uh, get prayer, uh, get encouragement. And it's when we break down the facade, I think, and, uh, and learn from others, then we're willing to, that, that it helps us in our journey. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've heard, so leaders are learners, of course, and, and the, the good leaders, the great leaders are consistently being unsatisfied with their current state of knowledge or empowerment. And I believe that, you know, learning empowers people. So, you know, what, what are some big time lessons you've learned along your journey in ministry, you know, even personally, like what, what are some things that you've learned that maybe, because we learn from other people, these stories, they, they lead people to the gospel. They teach us, you know, so we're learning today. The audience wants to hear from you. What are some lessons you can sort of capitalize on for the audience on their behalf? You know, one of the, I think, most helpful leadership lessons I've learned um, actually came from a group of 11 and 12 year old boys. Um, <laughs> we had a boy scout troop and it was a new troop. All the boys were, had just, were just first year scouts. We went to scout camp and, uh, because we were at scout camp, the boys were all able to go in groups by themselves, 
uh, without one of the adult leaders because there was adult, adults close by, but they were able to, to go on their own. So they went on this hike and one of the boys fell in the river. Now we went, the leaders, we went back the next day to check out the spot and it might've been up to the guy's waist, okay? He was in no danger, but those 11 and 12 year olds, they were convinced that he was going to drown, Yeah. okay? And so they went into, they didn't panic. They just went into a, like this adrenaline rush. They sent the fastest guy back to, you know, camp uh, to get the adult leaders. So we started racing down there and they formed this human chain to get him out of, of the river. Um, and all the while thinking, if we don't act, this, our yep. friend is going to drown. So they were pretty much uh, hyperventilating <laughs> as yeah. they came back to camp. And uh, the scout leader, uh, I was the chaplain. I, you know, I couldn't tie a knot to save my life. I didn't know all the camp craft stuff. So they said, okay, Mike, you can be the chaplain. And the scout leader, you know, they were like, and uh, so he said, hey, Mike, you go talk to him because, you know, you're the chaplain. And so I yeah. sat him down on a picnic table. I don't know, there's probably 15 of them. And I just started asking questions because I wasn't exactly sure what to do because the, the kid was, was fine, but how do, you, how do you deal with the situation and make it a learning experience? So yeah. I just, you know, what happened? What did you do? What could you have done differently? And what I found was by asking those questions, those 11 and 12 year old boys, they knew all the right answers. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to teach them a thing. They discovered it on their own. And I think the, the value of um, enabling people on a team to flourish and flower and do their role and, and take care of their own responsibility as much as possible on their, not on their own, but through their own initiative, their own decision-making. And most of the time, it's just asking questions. Well, what do you, how, how do you think we should deal with this? Uh, what are your thoughts about how we should address this? Um, and not, you know, sometimes you can ask a question and it's such a leading question. It's, it's just right. like a backhanded, here's what you're supposed to do. Sure. If you ask legitimate questions that don't presume the answer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, in the time, just over the last few years, I would guess that when, when I've asked the questions, 49% of the time, the team comes up with a better answer than I had. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking, here's what we ought to do. And they come up with a better answer. I'd say 50, 49% of the time, they come up with pretty much the answer I was thinking. And I, I'm guessing 1% or less, I have to break a tie or there's not consensus. We got to move, got to make a decision or um, heaven forbid, have to go in a different direction than the, the team wants. But that's very rare. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's fun watching a team flourish because they're able to, each person is able to, to take their area of responsibility yeah. and go with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that perfect Perfect lesson learned there. I mean, I would say what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, the right questions in the right moment can disarm or dis, you know, diffuse a situation because that sounded like it got a little volatile there. It can get volatile in our workplace and the team environment can just get a little heated. And, and I think the takeaway might be for the audience here is if we want to get real tactical is like the right questions as the leader diffuses the volatility and it also gets them thinking. And when you can verbalize something, you're actually also calming yourself. You yeah. know, if you can. Well, and there's buy-in to the project. Yeah. You know, it took a long time to get that out of me, that very directive mode of leading. It's um, to the place where letting other people take initiative, make decisions, et cetera. Yeah. So Cause you want to, you feel like, you feel like not only as the leader, do you have to have all the answers and that you're not, fallible sometimes but you also feel like you got to cast that vision in a stern and sometimes you do but but always in that cast a vision this is it black and white yeah. go forward go out and conquer you know yeah. and sometimes it's it it does need uh to morph into something different so yeah. all right so we got a little bit of learning there we learned some things and we transition over to the e of lead the LEAD, we're going to go with execute here. And <clears throat> this is where, I mean, rubber meets the road a little bit. So we take our knowledge and, you know, I've heard it said too, that 
without obedience or I'll even put in action, the knowledge can be useless. And so kind of to, to what the Bible says, hearers of the word versus doers of the word, right? We're supposed to be doers, not only just hearers. So when we talk about execution, what would you say is a big hurdle? There's many, but what have you seen in your t- teams that you've led, like people that you've mentored? What is the biggest problem with execution in general with people? You know, like you say, there's many different answers to that, and it depends on the situation and the leader. But here are a couple that I've seen. One is there's different personality types. You know, there's one type that's a dreamer, just loves new ideas. Then there's another type that is more of an implementer. Um, I don't know if I've had an original idea, but I can take this idea and I can make it work. Mm -hmm. And then there's another type of, um, of, personality that just loves give me the process give me the tracks to run on and I will run I will manage that process as long as you need me to and so sometimes it's a matter of personality that dreamer sometimes just keeps with going with the new ideas they just keep getting better and better you need those type of people but then you need kind of the person in the middle that's like okay I'm going to take that and we're going to go do something Um, so part of its personality another thing is you know (laughs) One of the interesting things as I was leading uh, short-term mission trips is um, the way we would do it is we'd have a team from the U.S. We would train them in evangelism and discipleship. We'd uh, have a national partners where we're going. We'd train them in the same methods, and then we'd bring them together, and the national partners would use the North Americans as kind of um, Mm. to get people's attention and then, you know, share the gospel and start discipling. But a lot of times we, you know, we meet at the, the hotel in the morning to everybody go out. And so that they'd come together, the teams were all there. And I'd look around, it's like, nobody is moving. They were going to head to, you know, 15 different places around the city we were in and nobody was moving. They were just sitting there. And over and over again, I would just have to say, okay, it's time to go. Somebody, and they would take yeah, off. Somebody it's like fire sometimes the somebody, yeah, yeah, somebody just give people permission to go. So sometimes it's just a matter of, of, um, yeah. you know, somebody saying, okay, now it's time. The yeah. other thing is sometimes there's just confusion about who does what, you know, are they responsible or are they responsible and who's, am I waiting on them? And so yeah. I think, uh, and a that goes to the leader. Of, yeah. Leader yeah. Creating the big clear, part of the leadership yeah. is, okay, here's your responsibility. Here's your responsibility. Here's how you're going to work together. This is the person that's, you know, going to make the final decision on yeah. these particular things. Yeah, for sure. Well, so along those same lines of, of the dreamer that's out there, I mean, I, I would probably fall into that category sometimes, you know, and, and I've, I've had a lot of great ideas and uh, even the book that I wrote last year, you know, has been kind of percolating in me um, through the last three or four years. And, so what do you, what, what advice do you give that dreamer that's, that is held back somewhat? Of course, fear is a part of it, right? Resources may be a part of it, you know, being time, money, whatever that resource is. But what, what do you say with somebody that may be struggling being stuck in that phase? I think a big part of it, it's, it's all about people and it's all about relationships. And, uh, so, you know, having the right, partners, the right team, uh, even if it's just one more person, just with a different personality, a different look at looking at the diamond from a different facet. Sometimes it, it just takes a different somebody else to help make the dream um, fire. So uh, yeah. I would say uh, get, get good people around you uh, because the people make all the difference in the world. Yeah. And, 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 and somebody that isn't afraid to maybe tell you the truth as well, um, that can kind of kick you in the rear sometimes and say, look, you're your own worst enemy here. You know, this thing needs to have, have to, needs to grow legs and you're, all, you're the only thing keeping it from happening. You know, yeah. we need, we need that person too. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I, you, you know, yeah, years ago I read this book, I think it was called just do something or something like that. But the, the, so I don't remember the title or the author, but I may remember the premise. And the premise was, you know, back in the 1950s, if you were um, 
Procter and Gamble, you knew if you spent this money, much money on TV ads, you would have this much increase in sales. It was very predictable because there was only a few communication, you know, uh, marketing channels. But today that's impossible. You never know what's going to happen. Nobody is smart enough. You can't use predictive reasoning. You've got to just come up with an idea, go to market, test it, and then tweak it. Yeah. I mean, in, in the days where the color of a button on a website can make a big difference or the placement of a button yeah. or the wording of the button can make a, you know, uh, a big swing in results. Yeah. You just have to, you just have to pull the trigger at some point. You just have yeah. to do something and then tweak as you go, analyze and tweak. So sometimes it's, yeah. well, I, I don't know if it's perfect yet. Well, it's never going to be perfect. And when you finally do it, you're probably going to change it because something is going to uh, work differently. I agree. I mean, every, I think in that context, I think it's, it's a fluid document. Like you need to understand the fluidity of this. Like things are, are going to change. Things are going, that's the only constant in life is change. Like things are going to need to be adjusted. And we're going to get into that next here about adapting. But, you know, I even, as you're talking, I'm thinking, man, what a parallel in our spiritual life too. We wait so long to come to Christ or to understand the gospel or to get right you know, and, and really get close to God and, and make some changes because we're thinking, well, when I get to this point, right, I'll then do I'll it. be ready. Yeah. Yeah. When I do this, I can go to church. When I do this, when I get better at this, then I might get my Bible out or make that call to a friend or whatever. Do you have anything to add to something like that in that context and that comparison? Yeah, it reminds me of, uh, you know, young couples are like, oh, it's just not a good time to have our first child. That's it. And there's never a perfect time to have your first child, okay? Don't have it's, enough money. You right? know, it's never, yeah. but somehow families make it no matter when the first kid comes or the ones after that. So that's right. At some That's point, right. you just got to pull the trigger and go to market. And uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. Move from there. Well, and uh, so as we talk about, uh, you know, just get out there and do it and, you know, fail forward. And I re I heard a podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago that the, a guy and I, gosh, I can't remember his name, but talked about 10,000 experiments versus 10,000 hours. So do enough of experiments and you're going to figure this thing out, right? Instead of locking in and spending 10,000 hours, wait until this thing is perfect. So, uh, you know, a caveat WD 40, right. Failed 39 times. So, um, <laughs> that's for somebody out there right now. Uh, so as we talk about dreams and getting out there and just having some, um, uh, fortitude to go ahead and do it, we, we do need to talk about adapting. So LEAD, the A is adapting, right? A, or it could be adjustments, whatever. Um, as people speak generally, uh, just from what you've seen in your experiences, even personally, like what do you struggle with when it comes to making adjustment? Is it the identification of that that needs to happen or is it the actual implementation of it? You know, again, this is one of those areas where there's lots of different of course. explanations for different situations and different leaders. But let me tell you one, one obstacle I've seen in our organization is success. Mm. Se success at one level often um, hinders moving to a new level. I'll just give you a, a simple example. When we first started doing our uh, mission trips, when we did evangelism, we had a, a printed, um, uh, tract that had some questions on so it was like um, so we would we would translate it and then we would go and start asking these questions and through the questions we would present the gospel mm. and um, we did that for many years very successful but then we ran into more and more illiteracy and things like that um, and so a couple of the guys on our our team at the time um, uh, one, one's named Nathan one's named Jim they they saw this, uh, this cube that you could fold open. And, and so they decided, let's put the gospel in pictures on that cube. And it became the Evangel cube. Mm -hmm. And just the mechanics of how the cube 
unfolded. I should have one here to show you, but I don't. Um, I'm not that prepared, I guess. <laughs> but just the mechanics of it would get people's attention. But then as, as they looked at the pictures and the person explained the gospel, um, they would, uh, that's how we started presenting the gospel. And the people that, uh, some of the people who were the most successful using the track, it took them two or three years to make the adaptation. Mm. So we went on and did that for, for years, got everybody on, on board. And then we came to the conclusion, we have so many people coming to Christ. And even at a, you know, a couple dollars a piece, we can't get, and we want these new believers to learn immediately how to share their faith so they can, because their sphere yeah. of people far from God is probably the largest it's ever yeah. going to be when the day they come to Christ, because more and more people are going to yeah. become Christian. And so it's like, well, it's, it's financially not feasible to have multiplication uh, with this thing. And so we started transitioning to the three circles gospel presentation, which you can, it still uses pictures, but you can just draw them on a piece of paper or in the sand or, or wherever. Mm -hmm. So there's no cost to it. And again, the people that were the most successful at using the Evangicube um, were some of the later adapters to moving to this new method. And now everybody's transitioned and everybody, you know, acknowledges now there's no hindrance to training as many new believers as God brings uh, to how to share their faith. And, but it yeah. was the success that kind of was the, the break on some people making the adaptation. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes it's fear of failure. Sometimes it's success and fear yeah. of not, um, you know, meeting those goals in the future. Right. And what's the expression? Like, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Right. So right. we've all fallen into that trap of, well, things are going well, so we must not need to, to make any adjustments. Well, to me, the whole reason you were successful in the first place was because you were open to growth. And so to have that growth mindset continue to be birthed in you uh, daily, because there is, you know, leaders, we're talking about growth all the time. And, and so that, that complacency can set in, unfortunately, but yeah, the adjustments need to happen because we need to constantly be sort of analyzing and not to a sense of paralysis, but we need to kind of be analyzing, okay, what are we trying to accomplish? How can we grow and accomplish it on a bigger scale? And if that's the case, then we do need to make adjustments. So I love that story, man. I love it. Um, and, and time too, it's a, you know, isn't it a marathon rather than a sprint, right? We're not just running real fast to this success tape or finish line. And then who we just kind of, that's, coast right autopilot yeah. you know it's a and, marathon we got to keep going and sometimes god just redirects sure and now i cannot i cannot fathom the blessings that i would have missed if i had said no i think i'm gonna i'm, I'm fine where i am and yeah uh, okay so you know talking about adjustments and adaption you know adaptation um you know there's got to be uh, a point where we dial in. So if we're dialed in to what God has for us, if we're, cause you said something that was key, you know, he's going to re he can redirect. He might redirect if, but we're never going to know that if we're not connected. Right. So I think the message in that piece is that, you know, the more we stay connected and it's an ongoing thing, you know, getting right and being, getting in our, uh, the knowledge of the, the Holy spirit and knowing what he's trying to direct us to do. That's a big part. Um, but you know, be willing, be, be humble enough to make course corrections too. When you feel that impartation or that direction, um, did you have any, uh, big moments along your, you know, during this time with, with I am second and E3 partners, like, did you have any big kind of defining moments that, uh, you had to do some course correction and, and, you know, aside from the law, you know, the profession switch, but anything right now where you are that you, you realized you needed to make a change? Um, yes. Uh, for, I didn't start I Am Second. Uh, Nathan and Adam did, did such a great job kind of setting the foundation and, and the, the look and feel and all of that. And then the filmmakers, uh, Scott and Sam, that they worked with initially to to, you know, set what the films look like. Um, and I was on the church planning side of things and um, was over all of our international ministry. And one morning I was out on a walk 
um, in our neighborhood and uh, God spoke and said, I want you to go to the I am second team, which was like three people at the time. And, um, and so it, what looked like a big demotion, but he, I mean, I knew he, it was him. I mean, I could physically sense his presence. I could, um, I can show you even today exactly what's where I was on the sidewalk when it happened because it was so dramatic. Yeah. Powerful. And uh, there was no question about what he had spoken. And that doesn't happen to me very often where I'm, you know, crystal clear that was God. Um, And so making that transition. And so we talked to our leadership and, and uh, they concurred that I was being called to do that. So we scrambled and, after a couple uh, weeks, we were able to kind of realign our leadership team. And I went on somebody else's team where I'd been leading um, virtually all of the ministry um, part uh, up to that point. But again, it was a very clear call. And as I mentioned before, I cannot imagine now not having done that because of the blessings we've been able to see. It, it, it was something God wanted to do. Yeah. that um, at the time it didn't make any sense, logical sense, but uh, he had plans yeah. that have unfolded over the years. Yep. Yep. I mean, that's awesome. And it goes back to what I said earlier too. It's not just about knowledge. It's about obedience and to know that, you know, that, you know, in your heart that God is directing you, but then, you know, you could have initially said, well, I don't really think that's, you know, some people still, will resist that. Even if they're convinced they can talk, we can talk ourselves out of anything. And so if you didn't see a fit, you know, on the surface or in your flesh, you were not feeling bent that way. You could have maybe had you not been obedient. I just think the listeners need to hear that. Like you need to be dialed into that and, and to be uh, humble enough to be open to, to redirecting when you know that God's got you going somewhere. So that's a great story. Uh, so transition for me and let's kind of land the plane here on lead L E A D and de- develop is the last one. So we've talked about learning. We've talked about executing, adapting. Now we develop. So some of the things as leaders, we are, um, and, and leaders, non-leaders, but you know, we, we are needing to, look inward sometimes to make adjustments, like we said, and, and develop ourselves. So nobody likes to, you know, in the world of participation trophies, nobody likes to talk about our weaknesses, but sometimes we need to look at places where we need to sharpen ourselves. So do you have any tools or or any strategies that have worked for you on just developing your skill set as a leader? Um, I think the, the first thing is abiding well, you know, if you abide in me, I will, you know, yep. do, do what I'm going to do. Without me, you can do nothing, Jesus told us. So I think abiding, uh, which, you know, for me is a quiet time in the word every day, or hopefully it, it, most every day. Sure. Um, and then um, just some other things that we've used. Uh, recently, our whole leadership team has gone through Enneagrams, and that's been fun you know there's different personality tests yep. that, that have I did that last popular. week <laughs> I did yeah that. and so it was good to, you know just to kind of the thing I liked about Enneagrams was it uh, not only showed you your strengths but it showed you your shadows your weaknesses yeah and um, and so that was helpful and convicting um, I really like the book The Advantage uh, by Peter or um, Lenciani Patrick Lenciani especially there's a chapter, I think it's chapter two about creating clarity and he's got a series of questions and I've taken our team through that several times. Um, you know, and, and just the second and third and after that, you're kind of refining what you did before. And usually it's a year or two or more between those just, are we on track? Has God been doing anything different with us? And just answering those questions in that chapter and another big blessing to us as an organization, we've had a corporate coach named Bob Beal. And uh, he is just, over the years, we've had him in and out at different times um, and then talking to him on the phone every once in a while. But it's, it, you know, just being able to bounce ideas off of seasoned uh, leaders and seasoned coaches, uh, because sometimes you're in the middle of this gnarly situation and it's like, okay, 
here it is, suggestions. Um, and uh, he has a lot of tools at his uh, website. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's been a help. Yeah, inviting somebody to see those blind spots is crucial, um, definitely. And, and to kind of get outside of your tunnel vision sometimes. Uh, the So Advantage is the book you mentioned. That's a, that's a great one. I'm going to have to write that down. Um, you know, I see you're a you're definitely a reader in the back. You've got a lot of books as, as do I, and, and I'm starting to read a lot more, you know, because life happens and you, like I said, you find reasons not to, but um, you know, what about when you talk about just developing yourself? Um, do you, when purpose and passion, so if we can get those to somehow collide in our lives, man, that to me is the sweet, spot that's the secret sauce is is if we can identify our passions and we can align that with what we feel god's purpose is for us what we're called to do you know we're unique what our place in the world is man talk about how you found this out like talk about how you came across and how this happened for you because we've got an audience out here that Everybody talks about purpose, and that's a that's a word we throw around a lot. But sometimes we don't always know what our passion is. We think that if it's a, you know, if I like driving fast on the highway, then I'm supposed to be a NASCAR driver. Well, that's that's not what we're talking about. So talk about passion and purpose and how it aligned for you and how you knew that. Um, I think it's important just to get moving because a lot of times our passions are connected with our spiritual gifts. And a lot of times we don't know what our spiritual gifts are. We can take a test, you know, a, in, mm -hmm. you know, a survey or whatever, but a lot of times we don't see them. We don't sense them until it's in the middle of action. So I actually think that obedience is the key or a key. And that is being obedient to what Christ says and, and being active in the faith and not just be a, uh, a spectator yeah. and the more we're active in our faith i think the more we sense uh, where we're going to go and then we find out i just tell you a story we had a um a young lady on our staff and uh, she was in the hr department and she had to go through our evangelism and discipleship training even though she wasn't going to be a trainer she needed to go through that because all of our staff go yeah. through our training so they know what we do well she brought her husband evan and he went through the training, and then part of the training is we always go out and share the gospel, knock on doors, or do something like that, just to practice and get people kind of over that first hump. He did not realize he had the gift of evangelism oh, wow. until he did that, and he uh, he was a graphic designer. Now he's on our now he's on our staff oh, full time wow. as a as a church planter in the Northwest, the U.S. Northwest, and so it was by just his wife said, Hey, would you come to me? It says on a Saturday, let's do this together. And he did that. And it's in the midst of just taking small steps of obedience that he discovered a passion of his, that he's now, his life is wrapped around that. And so I think um, just take whatever next step is available and try different things. And God will, um, will show you your passion. Um, and, you know, over the, I've been with the organization now 29 years. I probably had, I don't know, 10 or so different roles uh, along those times. And every one I've really enjoyed and they've been much different. And I think mm. God gives us grace yeah. to do what we're supposed to do when we're doing it. If yeah. it's in, in obedience to him. And in those cases, if, I don't know if any of those jobs were things I asked to do. They were like somebody, you know, one of our leaders would say, Hey, would you come and take this, this, uh, role mm -hmm. now? We, we have a gap here. And so, yeah. um, I That's think God good. in his grace gives us, uh, what we, the passion and, you know, if we delight in the Lord, he will give us the delights of his heart. Well, is that because he's given us the delights of his heart or because our hearts start to align with him because we're delighting in him first? That's I don't right. know what the answer is, but delighting in the Lord that's and part of that is start. obeying, uh, yeah. you know, it, yeah. the Bible says is, is a key. 
Perfect. Yeah, I like the story. The date night kind of turned into that guy's destiny. Like <laughs> that was crazy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, that's good uh, alliteration. That's, that's unbelievable. I think that's good. But the whole takeaway to me, like where I feel like that the meat, the meat is on the bone for sure in that comment was man, he was obedient. He went along. He just tried it, even though maybe he wanted to watch the game, you know, or something. But but we <sighs> sounds like to me he, he took his, eye, his eyes off himself a little bit and said hey i want to go be with her i'm going to go do this let's go let's go see let's experiment like i said you know 10,000 experiments um so he just went and he never saw that coming and i think when we take that step we we underestimate god so much but he exceeds our expectations and he surprises us and he stuns us and I think that's where the beauty of this whole thing is. And, and being a Christian and understanding how good God is, if we just walk in something that's glorifying Him, like you said, our desires and our heart align with His eventually when we get on that path. So you have a takeaway at all for, for the audience here as we kind of close up shop? You know, what, what's one thing maybe that you can say to somebody that's, that's a leader? Let's, you know, we're in a leadership role and, and we're, we're taking all that this, these things that you've said, learn, execute, adapt, and develop. What's, what's something that you would have them start doing today that can sharpen them uh, into this journey of, of really jumping into what they're called to do? Well, we have a, a way of describing, uh, jokingly describing our theory on leadership, and that's the knucklehead theory of leadership. And that is, we're all a bunch of knuckleheads. And if God doesn't show up, this is going to be a sad situation. And I think that that surrender um, and getting our eyes off us and, and getting it on the Lord, getting it on what he wants us to do um, is, is one of the keys. And it, it's a, abiding is surrender, you know, yeah. making decisions in prayer and consultation with others is surrender. So I would say uh, surrender yeah. um, on a daily basis um, is yeah. really key. Yeah. And that's, I mean, those three things I heard you say, abide, abiding in, obedience, and surrender. Those you cannot go wrong with, and, and God will show you things beyond anything you can imagine. Mike, hey, tell us where we can go and see some of those stories we were talking about for I Am Second and some of the places we can find a resource or two. Yeah, great. Uh, I am second.com. You can watch the films. We have about 140 films of people's struggles and then how Jesus uh, redeemed those struggles. And then hey, we can have. You, uh, will you do me a favor? Give me name drop for me for a little bit, just for the audience. Give me some bigger names that you know of, that are on there because I've watched a few, but just kind of yeah. whet their appetite a little bit. Yeah, well, we have a series, uh, eight film series on the Duck Dynasty family, the Robertsons, nice. uh, called uh, Dysfunction to Dynasty. Okay. And uh, uh, you'll be amazed at how much dysfunction there was in that family. Right, uh, right. Uh, uh, yeah. To begin with. Yeah. Um, uh, we have, um, you know, one of our, one of our most popular films is Brian Head Welch from Corn. You know, oh, because okay. a lot of people that are corn fans don't realize, or at least back in the day, didn't realize Brian was a was a believer, and just to to hear his story yeah. um, is yeah. uh, is amazing. Yeah, there's some big names out there. So okay, so I am second dot com, and then what else for us? And then we have a resources page, uh, I'm second dot com slash resources, where people can go. And uh, there's discovery Bible studies that go with about 90 of our films. There's other discipleship tools. Uh, probably the best thing to do is we have something called the Live Second Community, um, which they can, it's a free thing to sign up for, but they, you know, we, we there's a steady stream of information and tools that, that we uh, distribute to the Live Second Community, and they can just sign up for free on our website. Uh, we're, we're getting ready to launch uh, this fall, uh, September 2021, uh, a, something called the My Second Story Challenge. And we're going to challenge people to learn how to share their testimony in 30 seconds or less, film it, and put it on their social media. 
Elevator pitch. Let's go. I'm in sales. I know what that's like. Yes, that's you right. Be able to say it. Let's go. So can you do it in 30 seconds or less? So we're gonna we're gonna have a big push to get people to do it. It's gonna be really fun. Um, and the best, it's it's not up yet because uh, we're still putting everything together. But if they join the Live Second community at imsecond.com then uh, they'll be some of the first to yeah. hear when we get ready to do that. So uh, Perfect. it'll be great to do with small groups, with youth groups, to do it, to do it with others, to have fun developing it. And yeah. can you do it in 30 seconds or less and not use church words? That's awesome. So that no, people far great. from God will understand what you're saying. That's great. Yeah. Training without calling it training. I love it. Uh, hey, so on behalf of the audience, I got to say thank you. I know you're busy. Thank you for carving out some time today. Thank you for giving all your demands and your time. Thank you for your wisdom that you shared and just your perspective. It's been a blessing. And audience, till next time, he's been Mike Jorgensen. We've been last in line. Be blessed. Be blessed.